Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Pure and Heart Show. Myself, Harry, and Helen, we're here in the studio, Radio Maria Ireland. So we're looking at, this is part 12. Gosh, you're really getting into this now. Mm -hmm. Edward Tree's Men, Women, and the Mystery of Love. Um, amazing book. Uh, I hope everybody is doing well in this not so cold January. Actually, it's quite bizarrely it's so nice. warm. It's actually yeah, it's quite it's reassuring. Beautiful. Yeah, it's very sunny today as well. On the way out here, I was getting glared at in the eyes. It was amazing. So Helen, we have had an interesting <laughs> experience. We were over in America. We had our mission trip to the United States. Uh, we first we went to a retreat. Bill Donahue's. Uh, uh, TOB Institute retreat at the Way of Beauty, which is fantastic. It's really, really, truly special. Much better than I could have allowed myself to anticipate beforehand. Um, and I got so much out of it. More than I, I really needed it. It's like one of those retreats that sneaks up on you, and then you you really need it more than you realize. So it was like that for me, for sure. Praise God. Just to tell the listeners a little bit. So the Theology of the Body Institute, the headquarters, um, where all the amazing materials of Theology of the Body books and different. Uh, literature from Bill Donaghy and especially Christopher West, it's in Philadelphia. So we had the absolute privilege to uh, to go there as Pure and Heart International Mission Team. So we had two uh, fantastic girls from London, Anna and Abby Hale, um, came from London. And then we had the three Swansea um, mission team. So we had Luke, Michael and and Bethan, and then myself and Harry. So the seven of us embarked on this adventure. Um, Pure and Heart International. <laughs> amazing. First time ever that's happened, by the way. It was truly historic. It, it is. Amazing. It is. We've never come together like this. And um, the retreat was stunning. And um, as you said, Harry, like it was just, I think it was highlighting um, different ways in prayer that we can stop and really appreciate God's presence. And mm. it was looking at theology of the body through the lens of beauty. So we read a lot of poetry. Uh, we read a, like a lot of sculpture, paintings. And we got to really like just sit with it, just sit and just be present mm. and just take it all in. There was no rush. It was no hecticness. We totally didn't know what time of day it was or what day of the week it was. <laughs> it was just all a blur. Uh, the food was unreal. Like A lot of food. Three times a day, all you can eat pretty much. It was really, wow. And they gave us their Philly cheesesteak as well, which is pretty special. So, yeah, my so. goodness. Oh, and their bacon. The bacon. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Their, their maple syrup was good because it was so far north in the United States that they actually, it was basically really close to the border of Canada. So they had really good maple syrup. It was special. It's so funny because remember, um, it was like one of the days we didn't get uh, bacon. And Bill Donahue was like, oh, he didn't get bacon. Oh, no, they got bacon. And it was the next day they got bacon. <laughs> and I was like, that was not bacon. He was like, that was bacon. Oh, no, sorry. They had this like slices of ham. Oh, and yeah. I, and it was basically like um, like pork medallions, basically. Okay. So it's basically like bacon in Ireland, okay? But he was like, no, 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 that's not bacon. That's ham. So their rasher or their, like, their streaks, the kind of... Short, shorter ones that's their bacon so I learned mm. something new <laughs> yeah American bacon really skinny little strips of crispy del deliciousness it was pretty uh... <laughs> it was just fat to be honest <laughs> yeah it was just pure pure fat it was yeah a lot of calories but it was good it was nice uh, and then we went to Boston. We met up at Pure and Heart America in Boston, which is truly incredible. So then we had a full complement of Pure and Heart International. And um, our good man, Fernando, over there, hats off to him. Uh, he drove us all the way from Philly down to Boston, which is incredible. It was like an eight-hour trip. Uh, almost. How many hours? Was it seven hours? Uh, when the end was well, we did, stop. we did stop we for stopped, Chick-fil-A. Yeah, we stopped, at, we stopped <laughs> at the Bronx to get Chick-fil-A. It was pretty, it was an interesting experience <laughs> <laughs> in New York. <laughs> so that was cool. But uh, a lot of mission stuff. We, we had an amazing experience over there. We interviewed, we had some really cool interviews. We actually did an interview with Bill Donaghy mm. in uh, the TOB Institute studio, which is cool. So that video should be floating around somewhere. Um, yep. And we also interviewed the chaplain of Harvard University. Uh, who was and will be again the spiritual director of Pure in Heart America. He is, isn't he? Um, yeah. He is, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we also interviewed uh, Father Michael, who is, uh, well, 
he's a, a Franciscan friar who is an amazing man. He's a really a beautiful holy priest mm. um, who was in St. Leonard's Church there based in Boston. So that's where we were staying. Uh, and he was just amazing with us. He introduced us to his friend, Ivan, who's one of the visionaries from Medjugorje. Uh, we, we got to have lunch with him, which was uh, an amazing experience. And it just kind of all came together in a beautiful way when we were over there. Mm. Uh, meeting all these people and sort of just having the pleasure of, of putting on pure and heart prayer meetings over there and uh, and singing, doing music, a lot of music as well, some amazing musicians over there and uh, just meeting really cool people and getting being able to talk in these different venues and get great feedback and meet interesting people there is really special, really, really spirit led. Another, I think, confirmation for us, which they, <coughs> in Boston, the Boston P uh, Pure and Heart did not know this at all, which is really funny. Um, mm. When we had the, the first um, a mass, um, no, it was the second mass we had on Sunday. The first one we had in St. Mary's in Brookline. That was that was also a beautiful church. Um, and we did a full day Pure and Heart kind of a retreat and our full uh, talk. And then on Sunday, we had a special kind of a praise and worship and mass. And Father, oh no, I think it was Monday night. We did a prayer meeting, Thursday prayer meeting on a Monday night. And Father Michael de la Pena, the Franciscan, he, um, during his homily, because we brought our, our relic of St. Maria Goretti that we always have in Pure in Heart here in Dublin. And we brought her with us and we said, oh, can we place her on the altar? And then Father Michael, during his homily, um, just slipped, just casually slipped in there and said, you know, we have St. Maria Goretti on top of the altar, we also have her inside the altar. And we're like, what? Like, that's wow. crazy. And like, nobody <laughs> knew this. Like, none of the, the Boston people like knew this, like the pure in heart. Like they were like, what? Oh my goodness. And very few Catholic churches have a statue of St. Maria Gretti. Mm -hmm. And that church did. Yeah. And that was really beautiful. That Let that alone church. a relic of Maria Gretti, that is spectacularly rare. Yeah. So it was really incredible. That was an amazing coincidence. Just these little confirmations of faith happening all the time and mm. little miracles happening, little guidances, signal graces, as I, I learned how to refer them as. Uh, that was signal graces. Signal graces. This is Abby Hale said that they were apparently. She did a bit of research. Oh. Signal graces. Little confirmations of faith, things happening that are just like, oh, that makes sense. Thank you, God. Those are signal graces, apparently, which is nice. Yeah. So, wow. Praise God. Yeah. Like. It was just a, truly a total surprise. We had no idea that Ivan, um, the, one of the visionaries of Medjugorje, was going to be in Boston. He actually lives in mm. Boston. His family is from, like his wife is living in Boston and his children, his four children. Mm. And um, Father Michael, his cousin is, is actually the wife of Ivan. And that was like, what? Wow. Like, we totally did not plan this. We totally didn't expect this. It was just all, again, as you say, signal graces. Like, it was just little things conf confirming yeah. that we came and that <coughs> pure in heart is meant to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, Just affirmations of our charism, even just the way we do things in pure in heart. Like, just uh, because, obviously, um, if you haven't seen the video, go to our YouTube channel and watch uh, Father Fergal O'Doul's uh, uh, telling of the origins of pure in heart. It's a video that we have up. Really beautiful. But we actually came from Medjugorje, Our Lady of Medjugorje, gave us the message, gave us the charism. And uh, that's what inspired the young people to to set up a prayer group in Dublin. Uh, and that was the first prayer group. And then it spread to lots of different places now. And it's continuing to spread. And do please pray for our continued mission as Pure in Heart is seeding in different cities around the world. Uh, oh, I was wondering when that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Hope it doesn't knock our lady That's statue okay. over. That's okay. okay. <laughs> but yes, please. <laughs> Hope it's not a sign. Okay. Yeah, please. <laughs> Sorry. It's just people who can't see this, the back of the... We've got some soundproofing falling down on top of it. Sponge. And it's just Don't like... worry about it. It's okay. We'll continue the show. Um, but yes, please do pray for Pure in Heart as we as we uh, see it in different parts of the world. There's a, a group um, hopefully maybe setting up in Mexico, maybe a few more around the United States as well. So please do keep that in the prayer. Praise God. Okay. It's been a while um, because we've been kind of pre-recording <coughs> our shows. Maybe you noticed that uh, because we were away for pretty much majority of January with the mission trip over there. So uh, we hope we're back on track. Um, as far as we can see from our bookmarks that we are on chapter six, we're just, we finished chapter six. It was about love and responsibility. So it's building trust, intimacy and a mature love. And <coughs> as far as we know, we hope that we didn't skip any questions, but we think we did the question four. 
Um, so we're going to go into question five. And if you have any questions whatsoever based on the book or any other questions or maybe how you want to get involved if you're in heart, um, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and remember that our prayer meetings are on. They're back in full swing every single Thursday at uh, 23 Marion Square North at 7 p.m. And we have mass adoration, confession and a short talk um, and also a lovely uh, social kind of a fellowship of uh, we got brilliant, amazing, talented bakers uh, every Thursday baking something delicious. Mm -hmm. So there's always lovely treats. Um, so it's going to be super hard for me when Lent starts to restrain Ooh. myself. Yes. Um, God help you if you're doing like Exodus 90 or something. Oh, yeah. There's a few people who are like <laughs> messaging and saying, oh, should I take this? Should I not? But um, yeah, no, it's been such a gift. So um, do, you know, come and if you want to get involved or you want to ask any questions, even related just about these topics that we're talking about, you can contact us on info at pureinheart.ie. We also have uh, Instagram and Facebook, <coughs> uh, so check it out as well, Pure in Heart Ireland. And especially on the Instagram and Facebook, we've uploaded a couple of pictures, a few highlights from the mission trip, so you can have a look and see what we've been up to. And our updates of events are up on the um, on the Instagram and Facebook as well. So keep an eye. And um, yeah, we're going to have an upcoming a uh, very special uh, healing retreat um, mm. on the 17th of February. So it's a Saturday. Take note. It's going to be a very special uh, day and it's going to be really focusing on um, getting sort of unstuck, untangled from our patterns or, you know, constantly meeting roadblocks in maybe in our vocation um, or whatever it might be. And it's just helping us to overcome and see what's what's holding us back. And there's going to be a bit of deliverance um, happening, you know, kind of helping us how we can pray um, and how we can channel our prayers to break through any of these um, ties that are kind of binding us and keeping us away from God's, God's plan for us, um, especially when it comes to uh, pursuing um, vocations, you know, to religious life or marriage. Um, there seems to be definitely an air in Ireland. Um, it's different in America. Um, I think in the cities, it's kind of the same as in Ireland. But for some reason, this is what I got when I went over and then went to visit some of my family in the Midwest and totally different kind of, I think, for young people, there isn't that blanket kind of a web um, kind of procrastinating them from moving forward and moving forward mm. and healing and and being ready, um, you know, to commit to whatever it is that God calls them to. In Ireland, there's just this like stagnation. There's mm. just this kind of a sort of a <coughs> kind of a feel like we're under this blanket or this kind of a web. And it's so hard to kind of get and to get out of it and to do something. I feel like a lot of young people are just stuck. So Father Timothy is uh, going to be our main uh, speaker for the Healing Day Retreat on the 17th of February at 23 Marion Square, so in our home base. Um, and he's going to be talking about how do we get unstuck um, and how can we uh, stop getting into the same patterns or meeting the wrong people um, and, yeah, basically just redemption for all of us. Mm. So He's an amazing ministry, by the way, Father Timothy Morn. A lot of people go to him for regular spiritual direction and deliverance. Uh, anybody who's struggling with any kind of demon issues or anything like that. He's got a really cool ministry. He's a, a demonologist. Uh, so basically he's an expert in sort of how the devil kind of involves himself in people's lives and tries to drag people off the off the path, which is really cool. So he, he basically specializes in deliverance ministry, which is kind of like unpicking the hooks that the devil gets into you so that the devil no longer no longer has a right to any territory in your life. And uh, really amazing. I mean, he's I've, I've gone to him several times and uh, really special, special ministry. And it's it, it's it works. I mean, the devil really um, if you if you educate yourself in spiritual warfare, um, it, it's essential, I think, really, these days for being for being Catholic, especially in the world we're in today, because it's just so much uh, set up to make you fail. Mm, so true. Um, and especially in terms of vocation, I think there's always these mm. blocks being put in the way. Yeah. And people are not actually just healed. They need a lot of healing, a lot of deliverance to be done, just prayed over um, <coughs> to free them from these chains. Um, and it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen over one, you know, two hour, three hour session. Like it is mm. persistence in this prayer and this purification because mm. we all hold a lot of baggage. Um, and it's even like medicine. It's like a... 
Mm -hmm. A course of antibiotics. You just got to keep the treatment going. You, know? <laughs> you have to f keep doing it until it gets Consistency is out. everything, you know. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah, okay. fantastic. So we go question five. So as chapter six pointed out, trust grows within the context of a truly committed relationship, one where each person is responsibly cared for and totally accepted. What are some practical ways to, cul to culti culti bleh, cultivate a greater atmosphere of trust within your relationships or marriage? What are some things we do or say that break down trust in relationship? How can we work to heal areas in which uh, the seeds of distrust have been, been already sown? Okay, so the first question, uh, what are some practical ways to cultivate a greater atmosphere of trust within your relationship or marriage? What do you reckon? Um, practical ways to cultivate a great atmosphere of trust. Um, I think in order to trust someone, you have to be able to be vulnerable, first and foremost. Trust comes from you opening up to them, um, being prudent as well, um, you know, depending on the stage of your relationship. But I feel like if you're waiting for the other person to open up to you and they're probably doing the exact same, you're not really going to be getting anywhere. You're going to kind of be just kind of cautiously kind of <laughs> trying to mm. calculate, you know, your way through this. Um, I think I think it also helps if you have a deep prayer life and they have a deep prayer life. I think it just almost organically happens. You just start to trust mm. each other. You trust that God has put you on this path for a reason and put you both together for a reason. And I think you need to trust. If you trust God, you have to trust then that he's doing something good in your relationship. If you if you are praying and 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 they are praying, um, you have to you just have to trust in God. I think if you don't trust God, you're not going to be able to trust another person. I just think it comes from there. Mm. What do you think? Yeah, I think part of totally accepting the other person is, and this goes both ways, not being afraid of of having difficult conversations like sometimes people in a relationship might avoid a particular topic of conversation or might avoid talking about specific uh specific things because of fear of conflict or fear of it being difficult and making it a difficult day for the two of you you know mm -hmm. um but what happens then if you avoid that is that things get hidden and things don't get spoken when they should and that's kind of in a, in a way not being vulnerable with a person that's kind of hiding part of yourself it's, it's about it's it becomes less accepting of the other person for who they are and um and not trusting that the, that the other person will accept you for who you are so if you've got something difficult that you need to tell your your partner your your husband your wife and then you don't it says just as much about your lack of faith in them and how they'll receive you in in love as as your own character, you know? So it's sort of, yeah, it's important to try and communicate uh, when there's a need to, for sure. I also think with time, um, as a practical way, you know, spending time together and also being surrounded by family or surrounded by good mm. friends, uh, doing wholesome things together, you start to see each other, um, you start to get to know each other more. And I think the trust builds and... Mm. Um, and, um, you know, the secular culture would say, oh, you know, just sleep with them and, you know, you'll trust them if they'll sleep back with you. And that's a very bad uh, way to go about it, because if anything, I think that creates a lack of trust and more trust in the relationship, because, mm -hmm. you know, if there is no trust. There's before, so much at stake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if there's no trust before <coughs> something so um, sacred, I think only adding that in the relationship it's only going to cause um, a lack of trust because you're going to be always sort of, you're yeah. going to be grasping and taking instead of giving um, and receiving the other person. Yeah, unless you have like a true base of intimacy in your relationship where you, you, you know you can be totally yourself and totally honest and talk about anything and say anything to your other person who without being without being judged or without receiving attack back you know where you can feel like you're in a relationship where you can totally be honest and share with the other person and that you can listen to them uh you know that's that's it has to be the base the foundation of the relationship otherwise you know it's going to spiral mm -hmm. because the next one is what are some things we do or say that break down trust and relationship and it is when things are hidden 
when things are avoided, when, when there's shadowy areas of the relationship that you'd rather not go into because it's uncomfortable. Or there's a, there's a reason, just something's hidden, some reason that you can't feel you can be vulnerable with, with a person if your alarm sirens are going um, about something in the other person. If something's taking away your peace in the relationship and you don't feel like you're able to be vulnerable with a person for whatever reason, those are kind of bad signs. And, and when that isn't addressed and when you can't have that flow of communication, then things tend to get worse. Mm. Uh, I think, I mean, obviously there's a million and one things that can destroy a relationship, but that's quite a common one. Yeah, the number one thing they say that... Um couples end up in divorce is a lack of communication yeah so if the communication stops or if the couple are not seeking to spend time with each other where they can talk and have that one-to-one and they're constantly saying oh no covering you know doing other stuff getting themselves busy whatever hurt that's in them they're just trying to bottle it up or cover it in and avoid confrontation that's only creating more distance and, you know, it's ca- causing resentment and it's building whatever it's happening. It's building the suspicions that you have mm. of the person and it's causing suspicions in, in your spouse. Um, and if you're dating, I think that, you know, it's something that you both um, kind of over time, you kind of build the trust, you know. It's different to marriage. You know, in marriage, you're called to already have the trust to some mm-hmm. a, a very strong level. Um, but when you're dating, it. it you, you're getting to know the person and when you see that they're kind of reserving so, certain things about themselves and they're not willing to explain why or willing to talk about them and they're shutting you down like those are really big red flags and I think it's really mm. important for um, people to take note of that and um, not to settle for this not to say oh well that's okay everything else is fine the relationship because sharing and trust is fundamental it's what's going to keep the relationship floating and going somewhere Um, because if you don't have the trust, you can't build a family upon something that doesn't even stay together, you know, it can't last. Um, Mm. So, yeah, I think it's fundamental that you have the trust. And uh, the last one is, how can we work to heal areas in which seeds of distrust may have already been sown? Um, So that's where there's probably... (sighs) most discomfort because if seeds of distrust have been sown in a relationship that means even if you have like a day-to-day superficial working relationship uh with the person um there's all sorts of barriers up you know and then while one person maybe who might have felt betrayed in some way in the previously in the relationship might have barriers up the other person might feel like they're walking on eggshells and your knowledge of your weakness in the past let's say or the other person's knowledge of their weakness in the past might be the perfect storm when combined with your uh your sensibilities and your prejudices because of being betrayed in the past you know so it's sort of i've seen that dynamic before you know where it's difficult for for the couples to uh to get around that and it really does it can cause a lot of pain and i think in those situations they have to focus even more and try harder to be, to communicate, you know, through the pain, because it's going to be difficult to be fully, you know, transparent and fully, uh, you know, receptive of the other person when there are these prejudices and when there are these, the knowledge of, of sensibilities and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's really beautiful that way you, you, you said that because I think, that's something that a lot of people find themselves in these kind of a situations. Um, it's extremely common because unless you meet somebody and you never had any previous relationships and they never had any, had any previous relationship, then yeah, you're kind of starting with a fresh leaf. Mm. Majority of the time, the audience that we're speaking to, that's not really the case. Um, it's very, very rare unless you're super young and you meet very young um, and then you, you, you make it work and you commit to this person and you sacrifice everybody else and you choose to love this one person and that's beautiful that's really common um in a, a lot of cultures and i think i think it, it makes sense you know i think in a sense that's really lovely when it works but unfortunately we live in a broken world and that doesn't always really happen and i think um i think that the deliverance is so important <coughs> like going um doing yeah. deliverance because a lot of it stems from bitter root judgment so it's basically um this concept that um 
your past, it could have even have been your parents. You saw the way they interacted with each other. Mm. You judged them for it. So you kind of have a judgment in your head already. So you have a kind of a bias as to certain situations that you come against with. Then when you are dating this uh, this new person, all of a sudden you're triggered in the exactly the same ways that you witnessed your past relationships or your parents' relationships. And it's because you judge your family or your past relationships for the way they treated you or the way they mistreated each other. And in a sense, you have um, a kind of a, all of a sudden, like a wall. And you're kind of in a way almost projecting that, that like when this happens, this is how I'm going to react. So you've already, mm. in your mindset, you've created a defense mechanism of how you're going to respond when someone's going to trigger you to in a certain way. And that person could totally have no idea that uh, they've yeah. stepped on a trigger or that they've triggered it. But you could also have no idea that this could be subconscious. That's the thing. Mm. It could be something so subconscious. And it really helped me, like, doing the deliverance um, prayer is that you're kind of going back and recounting different situations that you've seen that have uh, impacted you or wounded you and you can see the pattern of how they can affect your relationships in the present day and how you have made decisions or you've reacted upon situations based on how you've seen other people or yourself in other situations how you've reacted on them Mm. so you actually haven't really worked through you know these these wounds or these triggers and they need to be worked and if they're not you're constantly going to be triggered in the same way and it's just a, it's a constant kind of a pattern it's going um yeah keeps repeating itself and what might be a possible uh remedy to that then is we we need god to be our father to be our father figure you know and, and to show us you know as men i can say certainly that how to be men you know because we all come from families with imperfect parents you know like we might grow up thinking it's normal for our mother to talk to our father a certain way or our father to treat our mother a certain way, you know. Um, and other things that have caused us pain, then we react strongly against, as Helen was saying. Um, and it can be, as Helen said, very subconscious. So the way I've seen people come out of extremely broken and sort of damaged family situations and have beautiful marriages is by, like, completely giving themselves to uh to god and, and to be the sonship of of the father you know um where we we find a perfect example in christ um it might seem obvious to somebody who who <laughs> who's quite into sort of catholic uh content or, or or is really uh taking this seriously already but um we can really have an active relationship with christ we can really have a relationship like i mean it reminds me of what Ivan was saying, you know, like the visionary of Medjugorje. He asks Our Lady advice for how to be a father with his with his kids, you know, when Our Lady appears to him. You know, but, you know, he's a very spe- special grace in, in that he, he's able to see Our Lady. But, um, but Christ wants to have an extremely intimate relationship with every single one of us. And we need Christ in a relationship in order to be truly ourselves in how we should be in that relationship, no matter what the relationship is, fatherhood, sonship, uh, daughterhood, you know, whatever it might be. Um, we need uh, we need the example of Christ. And then that undoes all the damage, you know, but it, it is a process, you know. I think I wanted to add one more thing here is um, how can we work to heal areas? I like how you said we work to heal mm. areas in which the seeds of distrust, I think it's forgiveness. Um our world struggles to forgive and to learn how forgiveness works. And I think it all stems from that. And it is it is hard, but this is where we need to, again, going back to communication and bring these things to, to confession and um, bring them to a spiritual director and going through these situations and sitting down and no matter how many times you need to talk about it, because sometimes couples, um, you know, can get kind of a little bit, tired of the same of, of the other spouse mm. bringing up the same thing over and over again mm. and I think there can be an element of obsession over a particular topic as well yeah and I think it's important like that you need to understand like to get to know each other more and see where is this coming from and seek forgiveness and you know if you want to make this relationship work it, it is possible you can heal but 
will require a lot of grace, prayer, and a lot of forgiveness and truly to forgive um, in order that you don't allow what has happened to dictate your future actions and cause more distrust in the future because that's just going to send you back on the same spiral that you don't want to be in. So forgiveness is massive and I think it's the most hardest thing, I think, but it's also the only thing that the Catholic Church, you know, really offers um, in its fullest degree. And I think we need to we need to really go for it and keep going to it. It's not going to happen very quickly. We, people need time. Yeah. So should we do it, number six? Uh, John Paul II wrote pointedly about how genuine love is measured and when the beloved's weaknesses or even sins come to light. What is your typical reaction to others' shortcomings? Ooh. <laughs> and how can you maintain a truly loving attitude without approving of others' faults? That's the question, isn't it? Hmm. Hmm. That was measured. When the beloved's weakness or even sins come to light. That's true. What is your typical reaction to other shortcomings? Depends what the shortcomings are. I think everybody comes into a relationship <clears throat> with their own wounds. Even if they've never been in a relationship before, they've seen their parents, they have their own wounds from their childhood, maybe they've been bullied at school. They come in with all of these sensitivities or uh, prejudices or this reactiveness you know, to certain situations, a certain uh, sort of input. So if they find themselves in a certain situation, like your spouse or your, well, hopefully at that point you've gotten over it, but the person you're dating, let's say, might make a certain joke but it might be something that you were really heavily bullied for at school and you'll react really strongly to it, even though it's just like, you know, something innocuous to an outsider, you know. So it can be, yeah, you have to, oh gosh, I think something that maybe helped me was just communicating, saying openly, bringing it to the person first, or if they say something that's highly triggering, coming to realize that that's something that is not, um, that's not very, uh, how would you say, intuitive to the other person and saying, okay, look, actually I have a bad wound from my school days here. I'm quite sensitive when it comes to this, this, this. Um, I, I prefer maybe if we didn't, if we didn't talk about it this way. And then you'll probably notice over time, if the person is really receptive of that and really loves you, those things that you're hypersensitive about will probably diminish in their scariness as well. And you'll be able to actually sort of go into areas that you were in, that you're previously terrified of. Uh, it's part of the healing process. I think also, I think it's nice how he's highlighting here, um, what are your typical reactions? Because I think that there's always going to be shortcomings. And uh, no matter how many times you're going to work through different shortcomings, new ones will arise, especially people who have families. They know that once kids come into the picture, like it's a total other ball game. Mm. Um, I think it's something really nice here that, you know, looking and observing our, re our own reactions, how do we react? Because we're going to react, but we can see how we react. And there are different ways of how we can, we can react. We can react mm. in very expressive, very hurtful ways, very blunt and aggressive ways. Um, and then we can also react in more gentler, more, you know, um, thoughtful, more considerate ways towards the other person. You know, you can still show your reaction, but I think it's important to moderate how we choose to react. I think that's that's the part that a lot of, a lot of people struggle with, you know, is... Um, usually the person doesn't really have an issue with the shortcomings. The issue they have is how you react to them. And the reaction that causes um, the, the walls to go up or, you know, the distrust to be built, it's it's based on the, on the interaction, based on the shortcomings. Um, and so I think it's really important to always remember, it's really hard, but it's always remember to treat, you know, you know, try our best to be even loving in those situations. And um, I think it's important to understand, I don't know, I can't speak for men, but I can speak for women. I think women can get very emotional and very sensitive. Not all women, but a lot of women can. And so women can sometimes really react really strongly over certain things, you know? And for example, like if a woman finds out that her um, partner is watching pornography, 
that could really trigger her and that could really hurt her. Um, and, you know, she can really react towards that. And I think it's really important to understand there's a difference how women react to certain things and how men react to certain things and um, and to be aware and sen- sensitive towards each other as well. And that's that's not easy. Um, I, was, I wish I was a marriage therapist, to be honest, so I can kind of <laughs> see how people can communicate better, but I don't know. Um, mm. It'd be nice maybe someday we might invite him up. Yeah, it'd be great to actually get somebody because some of these questions are pretty, like, specific. You know, I'm kind of shooting in the dark. I'm just thinking, you know, what's kind of worked for me? What situations have I found myself in? Have I seen my friends or other people in similar situations? Or, you know, so um, it's just kind of our own speculation a lot of the time when we're talking. But it's it's just really interesting to even just consider these points. Mm. You know, and, like, obviously... When you guys are watching on YouTube or if you're listening live, do comment in your own thoughts as well or, or post them in the comment section. You know, it's really important um, to really consider these topics and to take them to heart. Um, how can you maintain a truly loving attitude without approving of others' faults? I think parents are probably the ones to ask this question to uh, who are raising kids. Um, and Jordan Peterson always says, "Don't don't allow your kids to do anything that makes you dislike them um and then he breaks that cookie open it's hilarious but it, yeah no it's very how do you maintain a truly loving attitude without approving of those faults what about on a relationship level like yeah on a dating level? we can talk about that yeah so so watching how you react as well you know taking that pause because very often um a person will accidentally step in the other person's foot and then the other person will bite them back and then the person will be like you've just bitten me out of the blue you know <laughs> so it's like then the war is on you know and even if even the worst thing though the worst thing is when that person just doesn't react to that but just takes it in and becomes embittered on their own goes away in silence after being bitten seemingly out of the blue not understanding where it came from or why or you know not actually taking it up in the moment so there can be something for for saying, for being the bigger person, as it were, and saying, okay, where did this come from? What are you okay? What's going on? You know, and if you know, and then sometimes, depending on the person, it might be best to actually, after doing that, saying, okay, look, we'll just take a minute. I need a minute to just calm down. We can talk about it then. But actually, having the maturity to to talk about it as soon as you're capable of talking about it, and not allowing time to pass where where it can fester and swell into something that's really terrible. You know, and then what happens is if you get bitten by the person you're you're with and you go off and it festers in your mind and it grows and it turns into a, a big ugly dragon with lots of presumptions and, and suspicions and speculations thrown in as well, um, very often it can lead you down a path where you start to see the person as somebody who they really are not, who they really are not at all because nothing to do with reality. And one person can be in a relationship with somebody and believe they're with a completely different person. And then when, if they ever do actually have that conversation and say, you know, and actually level with each other, when one person, let's say you hear your partner talking about the way they see you and you don't recognize any part of that, you know, that's a really bad place Mm -hmm. to get to. Um, And at that point, there's just so many knots in the relationship that could have been done done in the moment you know, it, it just, it's almost impossible to come back from. I won't say impossible, but, you know, God God has grace as well. And the sacrament of marriage, obviously, the, the graces of the sacrament is just, you know, that's what it's there for. But um, they say don't ever let the night pass without reconciling in some way or another. Don't without go to having, anger. Yeah, don't, don't go to bed in anger. Don't, scripture. Yeah. And don't, don't allow yourself to to let things slip you know to take the person up with them in a charitable way because clearly if somebody who loves you bites you in one moment verbally um you should have that again that sort of confidence in the person that okay this person actually does love me i love this person so the fact that they've done this is so uncharacteristic of of what i know them to be and how i know them to love me that there has to be something going on i know it seems obvious potentially as well but yeah, don't let it, don't let things go. You know, talk about it as soon as you possibly can. 
And when you have talked about it, I think it's really important is not to linger, not to allow the other person's faults. And then when you encounter another shortcoming, you bring back all the list that has happened in the, before. Like yes. that is really toxic and not good and will not help you in any shape or form in the relationship. I think it's really important that if something has happened, you've acknowledged it, you've spoken about it, you ask for forgiveness, they ask for forgiveness, you know, you've moved on, that's in the past. Don't mm. dig it back up and bring it to the to whatever situation you're in again, you know. Um I think that's so important. I think what, what tends to happen in a lot of relationships is that they can't forgive, they can't let go of that, you know, because we live in a bubble, okay? We idealize somebody, make them into an icon. Then all of a sudden when they hurt us, we remember that, we hold that in. And then we kind of forget, we go, time moves on, we move on with life. But in subconsciously, we're still remembering this thing that they did. Then when something else happens, oh, I remember that. And it's in a way they kind of allow the, the thing to happen again because they never fully let go that past mm. thing that happened. And so they're constantly just chaining and holding a chain of all mm. these these little, all these big and small and all these things that have happened in the relationship and they've never actually cut them and forgave them. Um, and so yeah. it just blows up and you blow up in your head, you start actually becoming a little bit dis delusional and you start making up this person to be totally not what they are mm. based on your unforgivenesses that have happened. And so yes. um, I think it's just, yeah, like, and taking taking accountability, taking responsibility, like, I think it's, it's something that in our culture we find really hard. We always try to back back up our actions and say, well, that, that I did that because you did this. And it's like, if you if we really want something to work in a relationship, we want truly to love this person, we have to stop backing up our actions. We have to take responsibility for what we've done and say, sorry, I've done this. Uh, and you can say why you did this, but mean you're sorry. Mean that why you were sorry for it. Don't have your sorry as a way of like, oh, well, that's why I did it. So I'm not really sorry, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, explaining it away rather than just saying, okay, I actually have hurt. Regardless of my intentions, the person I love is hurt by the result. So first of all, sorry, and then um, and then how can how can we make sure this doesn't happen again? You know, um, yeah. There's a great there's a great episode of our podcast. Uh, if you go on to the Radio Maria uh, .ie forward slash podcast podcasts uh, section, uh, resolving conflict in relationships or resolving conflict to marriage i think it's called it's really good um paul uh and delphine uh the french couple is it? yeah french couple really really good marriage counselors they, they they spoke about it. it's really amazing they go, went through these these techniques you know to actually like make your other person feel heard by you and actually you're taking them seriously i think just off the top of my head one of them was you know when you are when something, when you when you're married, when your partner, I'm going to say because it could be your husband or wife or just somebody you're dating, uh, does something that you don't like, um, to express how it makes you feel rather than how evil that thing is that they've done, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just a, the, the approach. And another one was, if uh, your partner is explaining how they feel to you, rather than preparing your comeback straight away, <laughs> take a pause listen to what they said and then try to say exactly what they said in other words as accurately as you possibly can so that the other pe the other person feels vindicated in that you've understood exactly what they what they mean and where they're coming from so you can say so you feel that this is that because of this because i did this and because we're not doing enough of this trying to reiterate what the other person says so it exactly represents, if not better, how they feel. Um, that was a really interesting one that they were talking about. And, and not actually saying anything yourself because then the other person, their guard is going to come down. They're going to be like, yes, you know, yes, that's, <laughs> yes, that's how I feel. And because if we only did this, then the, 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 the other person solves the problem for you. You know, it's like it does it much. It goes much further than than just having a combative experience. Yeah. Interaction. Yeah, I think it's a lot harder <laughs> said yeah. than done. I think. Um, yeah. Oh, that takes practice. I mean, they they literally like um, 
Paul, I remember when I, was, I went to him for relationship advice once and he did it with me. He was like, because I was trying to explain to him how I felt in my relationship with another person, right? So, and he was like, so you feel that when she says this or if you don't do this, then this is that. And, and then he just, he kept, and then I say, well, not quite, it's more like this. He kept just reiterating what I was saying and it wasn't patronizing. He didn't do it in a patronizing way. In the end, I felt really understood by the guy. You know, it was actually, I actually, you know, actually helped our friendship. So it's really, yeah, it's, but you kind of need to, yeah, listen to that episode of the podcast. It's really informative and it's very good. Uh, communication is is key, really amazing. And it is an art that you got to practice it's like so much because if you do it wrong, you know, worst case scenario, you come off patronizing and the person hates you, mm. you know, so. And like, I think like it just reemphasizes <coughs> that love requires sacrifice and love requires um, like you really have to choose this person. And I think that in our day and age, in our world, it's like when we come to these obstacles, we we are used to, oh, well, it's not working out. That's it. And we we get into this cycle of, you know, serial dating or multiple relationships. Mm. Um, throw away society. Throw away society. We throw away the person, dispose of the person when there could have been actually, it could have been a really good person you're with. Um, and you know what? This is how life works. So if you don't deal with your wounds or if you don't deal with your own shortcomings, they'll keep springing back up with in, in your, into your life, in your other relationships, in other ways until you figure it out. So to be really honest, you know, it's only when you truly say, right, okay, I have committed and I've made this decision. And I think that's why marriage is so beautiful. And I really admired that when I saw a totally different culture in America, like kind of aside from the cities. But if you look at the Catholic, like the good Catholic culture, it's it's very much so very loyal. And it's very like, it's not trying to be picky and choosy. I feel like in Europe, we're very picky, we're very mm. choosy, and we're, we're just constantly, you know, but there's so much choice, especially, I'm sorry, but especially for the guys, you have loads of choice. You know, there's a lot of really good Catholic women there. And you're just picky, you're just choosy. And um, it's also our society kind of endorses that as well, because that's how the secular world works and women freely give themselves away. And um, and it's it's really vicious, it's really toxic. And I think we need to just, you know, put our brakes and spend time growing and getting to know okay what our shortcomings are try to work through them and really like intentionally like you know find somebody and stick with that person i think that that really is the, the way i've seen the americans like they're just like okay i'm just sticking to this person you know i'm not i i, I know i can have a lot of other options but i'm going to be endlessly chasing my own tail i'm going to be endlessly just constantly like you yeah. know, not working out with this person, next person, next person, and you're just not going to find fulfillment. You're, you're always going to be chasing the next next hot thing, the next good thing, and mm -hmm. being happy in the moment when the relationship is only new and in your honeymoon phase. Once your challenges start to creep in, your your shortcomings start to keep in, people just leave and and move on. And so it's inevitable. You know, it's always. I think you just have to make a decision and say, you know, when are you going to work on yourself? And when am I going to, you know, make this work, no matter what the cost? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Heroic virtue. It's good. So question seven then. Consider the following quote from Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. Christ's love for Peter was so boundless that in loving Peter, he accomplished loving the person one sees. He did not say Peter must change first and become another man before I can love him again. No, just the opposite. He said, Peter is Peter, and I love him. Love, if anything, will help him to become another man. Christian love grants the person, grants the beloved all his imperfections and weaknesses, and in all, uh, and in all his changes remains with him, loving the person it sees. How have you experienced healing and growth through someone's consistent love for you, despite your own failings? Are you impatient with your beloved's weakness? Do you tend to, to want your beloved to change before you love him or her? How might showing the kind of love Christ showed Peter actually be more helpful? What are some practical ways you can do that? I think a lot of these questions probably more so marriage. Yeah, starting um. to realize that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose in dating... Um, you talk about missionary dating, you know, people like... 
seeing somebody because I thought about this before. Like if you, you, somebody can change after you're married to them and completely lose their faith, for example, and you still have to love the person for who they are, going through all of their changes. So if somebody who dates somebody missionary dating is probably the weird bad way to phrase this, but if somebody chooses to marry somebody who doesn't have their faith, they also must accept them for that, for where they are, and accept that they may never find uh, find their faith, you know. Um, obviously, that's going to be your mission, you know, if you, if you choose to marry somebody like that. Uh, your mission is to love them as Christ, you know, and, and constantly invite them into the love of, of the church and of Christ. I think that's exhausting. Um, that's my yeah. personal opinion. Yeah. No, but that's it. Like, because people do it, and it is. It's it's very it's very troublesome. Like, it's it's not an easy vocation. You know, I'm not I'm not saying people can't do it or anything, but just it's somebody to keep keep uh, in mind. But just as easily, you could marry somebody who's totally into their faith, and they can fall away. You know, and I that struck what struck me about saying you know through their changes in life, loving the person for who they are, because no matter what the situation is. It's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult at times to, to love that person in all of their mess, you know. But one beautiful thing that I've heard Catholic couples say is Catholic couples say is that the fact that marriage in the Catholic Church is indissoluble, that it's completely uh, faithful. There is no separation. There is no divorce. You know, well, I mean, the separation of prison violence. That's that's different. It's indissoluble. So you're you're kind of stuck with the person. But in a sense, they say that's kind of liberating. You feel free to be totally yourself, knowing that the person isn't going to walk away from you, you know, that they don't, they can't run away from you. So therefore, you can actually be more free with them, in a sense, let parts of your personality out, let parts of yourself, show parts of yourself that you would probably be afraid to show somebody if you knew they had a back door, you know. And that can lead, if you if you allow it to, and if you put Christ in the center of the relationship, they say that can lead to a much uh, more deep level of intimacy and and love, if it's allowed. Uh, you know, which I think is interesting food for thought as well. I think it's important. Um, I think Father Allen has these five C's in a relationship, and he says character, commitment, chastity. Um, what was the other two? Character commitment, chastity, and there's another two. I forget the other two, but I remember them for next show. And mm. I think I think it is important. I think it's prudent <coughs> because marriage is for life, and I think we date to marry. So we shouldn't yeah. be dating just for the sake of not being in a relation, or just having a companion or a friend, yeah. or not fear being of lonely. loneliness. Fear yeah. of loneliness. I think it's important to be really prudent and to you know really, really, really discern this. Um, uh, together with this person and be very intentional as well when you're discerning um, and you know really communicate your whole way through the relationship and say where you're at and what you're doing and where you're going um, I think that's really important I think that's the bedrock and I think then God willing that the healing and the growth will be only positive then because if you have a strong foundation if you're building your relationship and you're trusting each other you're opening up to each other you know I think also best friends, you have to be really close friends. You have to be able to be, have a good friendship with this person. And yeah. it's not just based on pure, uh, you know, chemistry or attraction. Mm. Um, and I think it's important, you know, to have that. And, and I think not to settle because what, what really does happen is a lot of relationships, um, people just settle or people break up because they haven't done enough work on themselves and they haven't healed or they haven't worked on their triggers or whatever it is, I think it's important to do that before you start intentionally dating somebody towards marriage. Um, mm. Yeah, I my view has really shifted and I've become actually more conservative on that uh, whole idea. Um, and, you know, other people, they, you know, praise God, they meet somebody who's not of the faith or of a different religion and then they convert, you know, fantastic. Everyone's different. I think it depends where you're at and where your heart is as well. Mm. Um, but I think marriage is for life and the other person yeah. needs to know that. And if they don't know it's mm. for life, it's indissoluble. Um, and if there are already, you know, different threats happening in the relationship, you're not even mm. engaged. Well, you really have to think, like, what kind of marriage do you want? Do you want a wrestling match all the time? <laughs> or do you want them to be able and just, you know, relax in their arms and, yeah. you know, enjoy going home and look forward to going home and having dinner with them? 
us your kids like if you were to tragically pass away would you feel confident that the other person would raise your kids with the morals and the faith that you would l preferably like to instill in them you know um and allowing them all their freedom in the process you know so it's kind of yeah it's a tough one um okay i think we finished our chapter chapter six um we what we're gonna do oh yeah the there is a First Friday Vigil. I forgot to mention that, actually. Um, so the First Friday Vigil this Friday. It's also the feast day of our Lord, the presentation of our Lord. So it's going to be also Mass for the Solemnity. So um, it'll be kind of a two-in-one, really, this Friday. So um, you're very welcome to come and to join us at 9 p.m. Um, we will start with a rosary, and then we'll go into Mass. And then the, we always... Fridays, the first vigils are slightly a little bit different format because we, we stay longer than in adoration. So we have a break um, for about an hour and we have some pizza and we have a short talk and some chats and some games. And then from half 11 to 2 a.m. in the morning, um, we're in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And that's a really beautiful, really special time. And we're praying for um, many things, especially that are going on in town on Friday nights and also next door only two or three buildings away um, we have a hospital so uh, we pray for the women that are in the hospital and the babies as well so there's a lot of good fruit coming from the, the Friday vigil as well and a lot of um, you know intercessory and special prayers um, and it's open for all ages as well so do mm -hmm. come along um, regardless of, of your age I know most pure in heart events uh, the, well the prayer meetings are usually 18 to 35 but uh, do come to this because it's open for families, people of all ages. So do, we'd love to see you there. Praise God. So we just want to conclude with a prayer <coughs> and ask our mother to wrap this whole show from the start to the end um, um, and place us under her um, mantle. So name Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 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 We'll catch you next week. God bless you. God bless. <laughs>